My name is George Galloway, presenter of Kale Mahorra on Al Mayadeen Television. My dear, I don't mince my words. I speak Kale Mahorra, and my audience does too. Kale Mahorra, free word, free for me, free for you. Catch it. Nice to meet you, brother. Welcome to Kali Mahora with me, George Galloway, for Al Mayadeen Television. Coming to you from London, but discussing the dollar, which means we're discussing the whole world. Some people think the American military is their, well, not so secret weapon. I've always believed that the key to United States hegemony in the world was their dollar. More particularly, their stranglehold over the exchange in the SWIFT system, which allows them essentially to lock other people out of the international economy. Ever since the Saudi Arabian uh, regime agreed to price its product, the black gold oil, in US dollars exclusively, the United States, when it came off the gold standard, has depended upon that dollar hegemony. The dollar, in short, was king. However, slowly but surely, the emergence of China as a superpower rival, and very soon, I believe sooner than the Chinese like to admit, China's economy will be bigger than the United States. Ipso facto, their currency becomes attractive to people as a reserve currency, as a means of trade, in the world, if only people had the political confidence, maybe courage, to actually insist that we don't really want to deal with dollars anymore. They are, after all, only paper, and not worth the paper they are increasingly not written on, because these are merely digital transactions, overwhelmingly. When I say the United States dollar is not worth the paper that it isn't written on, I mean that the deficits, the level of indebtedness of the United States, the absolute lack of correlation between fundamental strength in the American economy and the strength of their currency, is now so vast, but also so transparently obvious. The United States just prints money. It just keeps on printing money. And that money is related to nothing very much real or concrete, certainly not related to gold. It's certainly not related to economic performance. If it was, the US dollar would be practically worthless. The proximate reason for the whole world now beginning to pay attention to a subject that was once upon a time only of interest in rarefied circles very clever people, like the people I've got in the studio with me uh, tonight. The reason everyone's now focused on it is that the wave of economic warfare unleashed by the United States and the European Union against Russia has completed uh, the absolute unity of Russia and China with some countries like India, Iran, Venezuela, not quite in that absolute unity, but beginning to orbit around that Eurasian future that China and Russia have postulated. In which case, what's the point of India buying dollars to pay Russia for gas? What's the point of it? Why not India pay Russia in rubles or in rupees and rubles? Ditto, vice versa. Russia and China are now trading openly in their own currencies with no need of the dollar. And the SWIFT system is beginning to come under strain because 
Just like you can have two Facebooks in the world, two Twitters in the world, you can have two SWIFT systems in the world. And China has developed its own. Now, I'm just the enthusiastic amateur asking this question. Is the dollar the key to U.S. hegemony? And uh, the corollary being obvious. If the dollar is no longer king, does U.S. hegemony die with it? I'm joined by a very distinguished uh, panel this evening uh, that uh, will help educate us all on this subject. Let me start with Dr. Francisco Dominguez, who's an expert in political economy. He's head of center for Brazilian and Latin American studies at Middlesex University and has researched and written very widely on Latin America. Dr. Francisco, the, the truth is that every country in Latin America from Mexico to Chile uh, now has as its main or major trading partner, the People's Republic of China. Why then trade with China in American dollars? It's not going to last long that, is it? No, not at all. Um, China is not only the main trading partner of many Latin American countries, the exception is Mexico, but that's been rectified by Lopez Obrador as we speak, very rapidly, because he wanted to reduce the dependency on the US, 85% of imports and exports come and go from and to the United States. Uh, China is the main trading partner of 144 countries in the world, and this is expanding all the time. Um, the Latin Americans had a project proposed by Chavez some time ago, um, which was to create their own cryptocurrency, a sort of common currency. He called them Sucre, which is an important name in Latin American history, but it was an acronym. And that was going to be based on contributions made by the various Latin American countries, Brazil, Argentina, and so on, to this fund, which will create the Bank of the South. Unfortunately, there was a crisis in the world in 2008 and before, and therefore it couldn't happen. So the idea is there, and already some of the nations are trying trading in cryptocurrency. Venezuela has the Petro, which is based on oil. And it's based on oil which exists in Venezuela. And it's, it's, one Petro is equivalent to $60 according to what is there. So it's a promise of what you're going to get from the under, underground in Venezuela, so it's tangible. So the pioneer of this proposal is Venezuela. Now every other country, or several other countries rather, are using it. I think we need to win politically Brazil, which the election is coming in October. I think we're going to win. And then this process will acquire some significant weight. Is this a lesson that uh, Venezuela, which has substantially recovered despite all the sanctions and terrorism and all the rest emanating from the United States, that where a currency is based on something real, uh, that it has an inherent intrinsic strength that the dollar uh, does not have. The ruble, for example, is, is, worth, uh, is now valued at twice its value to the dollar uh, that it was before the war in Ukraine began, for example. Yeah, it's, it's, if you, the whole idea behind it by President Maduro, but also by President Chavez, was to overcome this dependency on the dollar. And the reason why they wanted to do it was not because they wanted to destroy the dollar or to eliminate the supremacy, but because they had to overcome the sanctions. And to base your currency on something tangible will prevent the United States from having financial maneuverability to attack your economy. And that's the lesson. And everybody else now, not necessarily copying, but certainly they know that that's what you have to do if you want to defend them yourself. And since the United States has 39 countries, which is sanctioning very heavily, um, you know, many others are going to are following suit. Mm. Venezuela, just to finish the point, Venezuela has been applied 600 sanctions. Um, Russia has been applied 6,000. Wow. That gives you an idea of the, of the nature of the scale of the thing. Shabir Razvi, economist, political analyst, a frequent guest on the show, always welcome. They say that necessity is the mother of invention and sanctions are a necessity uh, to uh, find a way round. Iran, for example, ha has been coping with sanctions for 
I'm trying to uh, think years. for 43 years. Uh, but it has not been brought down. Uh, Venezuela was not brought down. Russia will, will not be brought down. Uh, that must spell, surely, however imminent, the end of dollar hegemony. Look, George, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be part of a conversation like this that you usually organise. I think the current situation is really quite a Rubicon moment, I believe, just like uh, Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon River and marched on to Rome in 49 BC, and the whole history of Rome changed dramatically after that particular incident. So I think we are at that juncture in human history, whereby the war in Ukraine, uh, the uh, sort of underpinning of the ruble with the uh, uh, gold, uh, and also multiple countries, as you've quite rightly pointed out, whether it's Venezuela, Cuba, we forgot, you know, for the last 60 years. All of you know, my life. <laughs> you know, over 60 years has been sanctioned. Um, and I think what's really fascinating is that the nations of the world are realizing that uh, we cannot really continue to be used as fodder, as sort of uh, whenever at the whim of Washington and our uh, European nations who really follow Washington line uh, without questioning. Uh, and, and, and the world is realizing that uh, we need an alternative way of doing business, not only as an economist, but as a financial advisor. What I always tell my clients is never to put all your eggs in one basket. So, uh, you know, it's always sensible, uh, you know, if you've got 100 pounds or 100 dollars to put perhaps 10 percent in dollar based uh, uh, assets, if you like. And I would suggest that even that perhaps shouldn't be done. It should be moved to other currencies or other assets that people may have in other parts of the world. Yes, uh, the weaponization of dollar and the sanctions regime that has been the weapon of choice of Washington has not really uh, uh, created a regime change in Iran as you said, you know, for the last 43 years. And they have actually, and Iran could actually be a template uh, for Russia to see that how not only to survive, but to progress and to come out with innovation, which Iran has been doing, as we have talked on different programs with you on that matter. So I think, um, you know, um, I don't want to make predictions, but I think things are moving so rapidly mm. that, um, you know, one might have thought that in 10 years' time, the uh, supremacy of the dollar may no longer be there. But I suspect it might be much earlier than that. Fascinating. Let's uh, cross to the United States and talk with Michael Hudson, who is president of the Institute for the Study of Long-Term economic trends. He's a Wall Street financial analyst and he's a professor of economics at the University of Missouri. I can tell you something that you didn't know. His godfather was Leon Trotsky. Michael, <laughs> welcome. It's good to be here. Professor, Visa and MasterCard has been replaced by the Union Card. Sounds like a good move to me. Uh, of course, based on the Chinese currency and the Chinese financial mechanisms. Is that the shape of things to come? There are going to be many American services and goods and exports that are going to be replaced uh, because uh, people no longer can uh, trust paying in advance for American exports. And also uh, the uh, US and NATO have decided to draw an iron curtain around uh, uh, the uh, their countries, uh, Western Europe and the United States, uh, to prevent uh, the uh, NATO countries in Europe from trading more with Russia from, and China, from doing more. The United States fears a loss of its uh, economic satellites as its economy is shrinking and other economies are growing. So uh, a year ago, long before the uh, Ukrainian war began, they, they planned, how do, we, how do we make a break? Uh, between uh, Europe and uh, uh, Russia and China. And that's when they thought, well, 
the way to make a break is to make a, a big fight in Ukraine, make uh, Russia look so bad that uh, other countries are going to say, okay, we're going to buy our arms from the United States. We're going to buy our oil and gas from the United States. We're going to buy our agriculture and food from the United States. We're not going to trade with Russia and China. And that way, the United States hopes to uh, increase not only its balance of payments and the value of the dollar, but also increase its political control over other countries by being able to sanction them with uh, cutting off their oil or their food if they don't follow American policy. Well, look, they've excluded uh, Russia from the SWIFT system, the interbank settlement system, uh, as they previously did, for example, with Iran as an economic sanction. Uh, do you think this kind of move is going to work? It works very well for two or three days, and then it backfires, and uh, <laughs> the, it's replaced by uh, another system uh, that is independent of SWIFT, so that by, uh, th the hope was that cutting uh, Russia off SWIFT would lead uh, to an economic collapse of the ruble. The, the neocons actually believed that the Russian people would overthrow Putin and put in another Boris Yeltsin or somebody loyal to the United States. And they didn't realize that by uh, doing this act, they mobilized Russian support uh, for uh, the existing uh, government for, for Putin and uh, uh, just solidify the desire to indeed make a break. So the United States, instead of isolating uh, Russia and China from NATO, they've isolated NATO from all of Eurasia. And uh, it, it's backfiring. So uh, it works uh, very well in isolating the United States from the rest of the world and cutting the United States off from participation in the economic growth that is taking place in Eurasia. If Iran, Russia, China are already using a new and parallel system of financial exchange, will other countries join that? Will India join it? Will Brazil join it? Venezuela? There are many places in the South and in the East that could do with getting out from under the dollar hegemony. Uh, nothing is going to replace uh, the US dollar in SWIFT. What's going to happen is a parallel system alongside of it. And so there's going to be the SWIFT and the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and uh, NATO all in uh, one uh, set of uh, client oligarchies uh, and satellites around uh, the US as the sun. And there'll be another system going its own way uh, in Eurasia. So uh, uh, it's not going to be able to prevent this other system from developing, but in fact, it's catalyzing uh, the system. For the last two or three years, uh, both Russia and China have talked about the need to de-dollarize their economy. That was a, the long-term plan. Uh, nobody could have anticipated that it was the United States itself that took the lead in de-dollarizing uh, its own economy and cutting off its own source of uh, domination over its satellites. And this act was an act of desperation by the United States, fearing that it was going to loss to lose its European NATO satellites. Uh, and it's uh, realized it's going to lose Africa, it's going to lose uh, Latin America, it's going to lose Asia, but at least it can hold on uh, to Europe. And of course, Europe will be the sacrificial, uh, the, sac uh, uh, the sacrifice in all of this. Europe will be uh, a part of the shrinking uh, uh, dollarized uh, area, and it seems to be willing uh, to go along with this. And at least the United States will have prevented Europe from participating in the Eurasian growth that uh, Europe had hoped to participate in. Is this the beginning of the end of uh, dollar hegemony? Or to paraphrase Mr. Churchill, is it merely the end of the beginning? We may end the dollar hegemony, but the war uh, in the, uh, in, uh, with Russia and, and China, the uh, constant fighting is going to take at least a decade. What we're seeing in the last month is the beginning of a 10 or 20 year war. It's going to be very bloody. Uh, this summer, you're going to see uh, the uh, uh, many African countries turned into Ukraine uh, with uh, fighting among themselves. Uh, the United States is going to do everything it can to fight. Uh, and its way of fighting is simply to drop bombs and to destroy. So uh, the end of US hegemony will not be a pretty sight. 
Uh, it may uh, have passed the, the apex, uh, but on the way down, it's going to fight like anything and uh, cause uh, immense damage to the rest of the world. Wow. Hmm. Clive Menzies, researcher, analyst of political economy and a writer for Outersight.org. And another uh, regular guest on the show, Clive's experience uh, in a wide range of management positions in the financial services and technology sectors, uh, qualifies him mightily uh, for participation in this debate. Clive, I'm not going to tempt you onto the ground of Russia, Ukraine and so on. Let's just stick to the economics of this. It's not just the end, is it, of uh, the unquestioned hegemony of the US dollar. It calls into question fiat currency based on nothing uh, as a whole. I mean, Russia is now on the gold standard. Words you never thought that you uh, would speak again since the gold standard was abandoned in Britain in the 1930s, abandoned in the United States in the 1970s, no, it's back in 2022. Um, thank you, George. Um, yeah, I, I think it, we're looking at something much more seismic than just the dollar. And I think, as you say, it is, it's, it's this idea of fiat money versus commodity-based money, in effect, because commodities... When, when America imposed these sanctions, OK, Russians couldn't buy Mercedes, they couldn't buy Gucci handbags, but they have food, they have oil, they have all the things that Europe needs in particular, much more so than America, which has some of its own resources. So, as, as Michael said, um, Europe is something of a sac sacrificial lamb in this. But we are looking at a whole seismic shift in our perception of money. And at a geopolitical level, we can argue about you know, the, the dollar's dominance now being eroded by an alternative system which is more multipolar, shall we say. Um, but actually, that takes in the pound, the euro, the yen, all of which are fiat-based. Um, it's not probably accurate to say that Russia is on the gold standard as such. They have pegged it to the ruble thus far. But there's no reason why they can't adjust that over time, depending on what, what happens. So I think there's some flexibility there. Um, my, our work and research has revealed that what we're seeing is something much more fundamental. And you referred in your introduction to it's not really paper money, it's just digits. And um, Francisco mentioned digital cryptocurrencies. The internet has been a game changer. It may have been created by DARPA, the military, uh, but it has actually democratized the process of communication and transactions in a way that has been unprecedented. And so if that process applies to money, that we see different forms of money that don't no longer rely on this concept of exchange, because we have this big fallacy that's been foisted on us from God knows when, saying that before money came barter, and it didn't. Uh, what came before that was a much more complex, and uh, Francisco and I were discussing this because Marx and Engels looked at this, that the way societies operated wasn't on the basis of exchange. And what money did was to overcome the problems of what you do when you go outside the family or the community, it created this business of it, this idea of exchange and trustless relationships. So you trust the medium rather than you trust the people. Whereas what we're seeing developing in the software world in the internet era is trust developing between people. And it's only a matter of time before that sort of methodology begins to oust this idea of exchange money. Uh, this is something that's very difficult to get one's head around. And uh, I think, you know, it's taken me a couple of years to realise that we could do without exchange. But yes, there is this geopolitical game and undoubtedly America has shot itself in the foot and more importantly shot Europe in the foot. But there is a much bigger game afoot and the, f the frames of reference are changing. Money, money, money. It's a rich man world, as <laughs> Abba told us. I'll be right back after the break.
You're watching Kalimahora with me, George Galloway, for Al Mayadeen Television, coming to you from London, discussing the dollar as king. Is the king dead or dying? Will it be long live the next king? Or are we moving not just politically into a multipolar world, but financially and economically also? Dr. Francisco, just before the break, Clive made the point that you're trusting the medium rather than the person. When it comes to the United States, I don't trust the person or the medium. Uh, I'd be happy if I never uh, uh, bought another American thing or saw another American dollar uh, because I don't like bullies. Isn't this partly the end of the era of the bully? I think multipolarity is here. I think that's the key. And the dollar is dying. There is no question about it. Let me give you some figures that are quite important. The GDP of the United States is 24 trillion. The debt, the public debt is 30 trillion. The difference between the total uh, gross domestic product and the debt is 6 trillion. 6 trillion is equivalent to the combined GDPs of the whole of the Latin American countries together, including Brazil. That gives you an idea of the problem. That's number one. There is a US debt clock, which you can find in the internet. I ran it before coming to the show. And I ran it for five minutes. And in that, those five minutes, the amount of debt that increased in the United States was eight billion. Hmm. Now, eight billion is, if you have three of them, that is the GDP of Nicaragua. If you have five of them, that's the GDP of Bolivia. The United States has a very serious problem with infrastructure. Their productivity is low. The number of um, bridges in the United States that require urgent repair, not repair, urgent repair, is 65,000. The, the quality of the road, according to the um, American Society of Civil Engineers, they produce a report every year, 42% of the roads are mediocre or in need of repair the electricity plants, um, airports, and so on. Everything is a complete mess. The United States doesn't have high-speed trains. It doesn't. Sorry to say like this, even Spain has them. So that gives you an idea of the problem. And the United States economy is growing at a rate of something between 2 and 1%. The Chinese economy, with all the problems, is growing at a rate of 7%. So that means in the next 10 years, arithmetically, the, the US economy is going to be 20% bigger and the Chinese economy is going to be 70% bigger. Now, if you take what countries have done regarding this question of the dollar, possibly people do not know, but China and Japan are conducting their foreign trade in their currencies. Um, Iran is conducting their business in no dollar. Russia and China, Iraq, and many other countries. But the recent decision by the uh, Saudi Arabia to actually conduct the selling of their oil to China in Yuan. Now, China buys 25% of the total output of Saudi Arabia. This is 30 billion. The United States purchases only 7%. So if you keep going down, you can see that there is already a multipolarity of, in of initiatives what we don't have is the international architecture, financially speaking, so that there is a system which is coherent, is international, it works, it has uh, legal security that gives you legal confidence that if you enter into a transaction in that system, you know, whatever it is, you, it's going to be respected. That has to happen, but it's beginning to take place already. So the United States is, is in a real, real trouble and it doesn't have any possibility. I just looked at the budget that Joe Biden presented to Congress for 2023. It's a very long document. It has three, three key components. Number one, domestic security. is going to give to the police, it domestically, huge amount of resources. The organization Black Lives Matter said, this is not what we want. You know what happened when they have resources. And basically, Biden is trying to get votes from the right by doing this. That's number one. Number two is international security. He increased the budget, the military budget, to 773 billion, which is 30 billion more than in the previous administration. And surprisingly, he's going to apply a tax of 20% on the fortunes of 100 million upwards.
which is going to produce 360 billion and it's going to reduce the budget deficit and the deficit of the United States by one trillion in 10 years. So it's, going, it's totally useless. And in order for this budget to be passed, he needs to win in the House, in Congress. He, he's got a majority. Control over which he may well lose in November. Certainly, but at the moment, if we were to, produce, to propose it, he would pass it in the House, but he will not be able to pass it through Congress because there is 50-50. And Democrat right wing Joe Manchin already said he's not going to support it. So it's already not only is useless as a proposal to recover the economy, but it's already dead before it begins. So that gives you an idea of the problems that they have. So the issue strategically from their point of view is this. Do they continue waging war against everybody else? And who else is there to wage war? The calculation, it seems to me, was if we are able to bully Russia and make them accept our way, and then later on we'll continue with that until you know we produce something equivalent to regime change, isolating China thereby, and therefore the next move is to attack China. And this one hasn't worked. The, other, the next one is certainly not going to work. So the United States is desperate because he's facing a very serious challenge. Number one, energy and resources from Russia to Europe, which really needs them, and the Belt and Road Initiative by China, which is at the moment is in the region of $5 trillion. So therefore, facing with this huge, very attractive embrace from these two nations to have huge resources, one natural resource, the other one, technology, markets, money, and credit, and investment, infrastructure, is very difficult to say no. So the only possibility for them is war, war, war. Well, I've just paid virtually two pounds for a litre of petrol, not only pennies less, uh, which, for those of us who still think in gallons, is an unthinkable amount of money, uh, eight and a half pounds or more for a gallon of petrol. I don't think we can sustain that in Britain, never mind in Europe, which is even more uh, dependent. Let's hear from a good friend of mine, the rock and roll economist, Professor Steve Keen, who Thank nowadays you. is in Bangkok in Thailand. He's an Australian economist and author, honorary research fellow at the University College of London. And of course, I'm a supporter of him on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Professor Steve Keen. Steve, wonderful to see you again. Thank you. Uh, this conflict's not just a military one, is it? It's an economic war. Uh, if you agree with me, how did we end up here? Well, it's both economic and political, as most things are. And of course, the Russia once was part of the Soviet Union, and we know that the political contest between capitalism and socialism was played out between America and what we now call Russia um, for you know, 70 or so years. And the failure of the Soviet system is probably best explained by the recently deceased Hungarian economist Janos Kornai. And he argued that even if you leave out Stalin, you leave out the Americans trying to undermine the economy and so on, an economy with central planning, even if it's got the best of possible intentions, will fail to innovate. So what will happen over time is it will lose competitiveness in terms of the products that uh, its consumers consume, that its workers can produce. And he gave that as explanation for why capitalism grew faster than socialism. So you, you, even without all the interfering, this would have been the phenomenon. And what that meant in the real world was that, uh, you know, in the 60s, Khrushchev bangs the table at the United Nations says, we will bury you. He meant we will bury you in better consumer goods, which did not happen. So when the, when the attacks on the, on the Berlin Wall, uh, when the attacks on, uh, on the integrity of the Soviet Union were being driven, of course, the Soviet people themselves wanted to see the end of the system. Now, that's the economic side. The political side, and I had this explained to me by Jeffrey Sachs, uh, live in an argument on Twitter, uh, was that the State Department, when the Soviet Union started to collapse, the State Department actually wanted to help that cause the collapse of their political rival, Russia, once and for all. Uh, and that was tied up with the mainstream economists naively believing you could rapidly transition from socialism to capitalism, literally overnight. Uh, now, what that produced in the real world was utter chaos, the breakdown of the 
post-Soviet system with, when Yeltsin was in charge, and it led to the rise of Putin. So this, this is the, the background here. And that uh, could have meant we removed ourselves from this political contest because drop socialism's gone. We're all capitalists now. It should have stopped that. Uh, but the Americans uh, and then NATO itself continued the pressure to break Russia. And there was a, a, a fascinating video, I'm sure you've seen, of Putin saying he actually very early on in his term approached Clinton and said, could Russia join NATO? And he said, I won't say what I exactly got as a response, but it wasn't encouraging. Uh, now, if that fork had been followed, we wouldn't be having this war. So I see it's a combination of the, the economics, the failure of socialism, combined with the politics of America trying to wipe out a, a rival, that of course being impossible, that it antagonizes that rival, and I think led to the war, war we are now in. And on top of that, the other stuff you will be thinking about, the fact that you know, Europe is dependent upon Russian commodity exports and no economy at all can function without energy. And therefore, this is also part of the, the current tussle. This economic war, won't it end up causing damage to all parties to the conflict? Uh, perhaps the European economies, most of all. Oh, it does. I mean, this is why when you look at the, the sanctions which were, Europe took out against Russia, those sanctions excluded energy. And, and this is, is why if you actually did try to, to use this you know, as an economic weapon against Russia, you'd cripple Europe. Um, even so, even if you don't do that, uh, the impact of the war is going to cripple Africa because uh, Ukraine is, I think Russia and Ukraine are the two world's leading exporters of grain. America's probably one of the top, the, the top three would be America, Ukraine and, and Russia. Now, uh, the war itself will stop wheat crops and corn crops being sowed. Uh, there is also the boycotting going on. Uh, the main importers of Ukrainian uh, wheat are, are, are African states. So an effective boycott against food, which is feasible, will cripple Africa. Uh, an effective boycott against energy, which is not feasible, would cripple Europe. So this is not the sort of thing which comes out with any, any clean winners. Uh, uh, when you rely, when you relied upon a third party for energy sources, you are reliant. You, that third party can dominate you, and that is effectively what Russia can do over the availability of fossil fuels. Russia's insistence on being paid in rubles, for example, for its uh, energy, uh, is that going to change everything? It could be. I mean, the the, the, the funny, the, the amusing thing about that, in some ways, is that, of course. What they're trying to do by the boycotts is cut off economic relations with Russia, uh, but they can't do without the energy. Now, when, uh, when Putin says you must buy our oil in rubles, not in dollars, uh, then to raise those rubles, you've got to buy the uh, rubles on the open market. You largely, to some degree, have to be earning them, which means you have to have countries in the West exporting goods to Russia. So it's a very, in, in that sense, a very cunning ploy, I think. And uh, it, it could ultimately mean we break away from the, probably the worst economic mistake as a policy decision ever made. And that was the decision of the Americans, led by Harry Dexter Wright of the Bretton Woods Agreement, to insist that the American dollar become the reserve currency for international trade. Whereas what Keynes wanted to do is bring in a invented currency called the Bancor, which would be issued by what is the equivalent of the International Monetary Fund uh, on a basis of the size of the, each economy being involved. And, and that would have meant that no particular country could, could uh, dominate international trade. But it would also mean that uh, you wouldn't have the bad side effect that America gets out of that, that there's a demand for American dollars over and above the need to buy American goods. And therefore, the American dollar is inflated in value. And what that means is that the uh, the uh, outputs of, of America are more expensive than they need to be, which undermines the manufacturing sector. So those, those that are sets of enormous imbalances in the global monetary system, and it would actually be better to break away from a single currency. Uh, so I think this would actually, in, 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 even though it's not meant to benefit the whole world, the fact we'd have more than one currency is a step towards having a multiple currency system where no one country dominates and we lose this madness we've had 
since 1944 uh, after Bretton Woods of uh, a national currency being used for international trade. Is it seriously the beginning of the end of uh, the US dollar as king? Uh, that comes down to just how effective the strategy will be. And to be effective, it's got to be accepted to some extent by other countries in the world. That's, so we, we have the SWIFT system for international trade in the American dollar, for example, uh, and, and, and countries are part of that. Uh, the central banks of countries are part of that. Will that same thing happen with the, the other system? We don't know. Uh, so it could be, and that would be uh, a silver lining in the dark cloud of the, of the Ukraine war. Uh, but there's no guarantee that will happen in the real world. Shabir, the more I listen to you all, the more the, the Chinese uh, Chairman Mao's uh, statement about sometimes the enemy struggles might lift a huge stone only to drop it on its own feet. This all sounds to me like uh, the United States moving mountains only to drop them on their own feet. Not only that, uh, George, uh, whenever you talk about Chairman Mao, it, you inspire me of another quotation, not of Chairman Mao, but another famous Chinese war strategies that you don't fight wars on too many fronts at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I think, is a folly that is uh, being experienced by USA. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the professor quite admirably uh, pointed out, before I do that, I must promote uh, Professor Keane's book, Debunking Economics. Thank All you. of us should read Thank it. You. And I think it's very, very important because it will open mind of a lot of people what economics is, yeah. uh, if you like. Coming back to our professor from Middlesex University, um, is that if you look at many measures of where America internally is very weak. If you look at the collapse of the Soviet Union, and here there was a wonderful letter written by Imam Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Revolution in Iran, to Gorbachev back in 87, when he said that uh, communism would be in the uh, history, uh, in the bin of history, if you like. And he advised Gorbachev at that time that uh, perhaps they should also look at and abandon a US and sort of plan their own economy in the way that it, it is said. And it was really interesting that um, uh, one of the advisors of Putin, Mr. Alexander Dugan, I'm sure you've heard of him and all of us have. And he said an interesting thing in one of the uh, 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 clips on, on YouTube. He said, Gorbachev read that letter of Imam Khomeini and Putin is applying that letter. So it's quite fascinating what is going on at this moment in the mix of it. So if you look at different measures, the collapse of the Soviet Union at least protected the ordinary people because they had welfare, they had cheaper housing, they had um, you know, healthcare and all these matters. But when America, it, you know, because of the debt that it has, if it collapses, there are no Cushions. No safety nets. No safety nets for the American population. As we know, at this moment, 50 million of the people don't have health care. Housing is atrocious in, in USA. So the pain that is going to be experienced by the majority of the people in the USA is going to be probably prob more significant than what the people in Soviet Union uh, felt. So... The game that America has been playing because it has been able to bully the world through its military power, through its economic power, through its, uh, you know, uh, 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 satanic power, as again, Imam Khomeini called it the big Satan, and Putin calls it the empire of lies. So everything has been based on illusion, a, you know, what Hollywood is good at, sort of making movies out of it. And therefore the dollar has been used as that sort of illusion to create a monetary system whereby everyone sort of... Magic uh, tricks. Yeah, magic tricks and sort of everyone aspires to have the green back in their pocket. But the reality is that soon that sort of uh, uh, dollar in the pocket may not be worth as much as people think it is. And that's where I think the big problem lies. Clive, uh, you are, let me say, a, a kind of uh, um, a Cassandra uh, to some extent. You have preached for years that uh, the system that we have is 
is doomed, the end is nigh. Some might have dismissed you as a crank uh, for saying so, but you must be feeling pretty vindicated right now. Um, I'm not a doom monger because I actually see what's happening as a precursor to something much more positive. Um, but I think in 2008, when w w Congress was bounced into bailing out the banks in America and the same thing was replicated ac across European banks, we have a bankrupt banking system. Um, it, it, it should have collapsed years ago. And arguably, if you go back to 2019 in September, the Fed began expanding its balance sheet because things were very, getting very tense within the interbank market. The system has been broken for a long time. It's a slow motion train crash. And all, the only remedy they've had is to pour more and more money, to create more and more money. Now, John Law did this in 1720 in France and had to flee for his life because he collapsed the currency. Uh, we saw it again in the 1920s when the Weimar Republic, uh, when it, you needed a barrel load of uh, Reichmarks to go and get a loaf of bread. So these, these things are inevitable. This idea, you, you said I wouldn't trust Americans anywhere. I don't think you mean individual Americans. You're talking about the American government. And we need to get away from this idea that what our governments do is in any way related to our interests, because it's not. And I think over the last two years, people are beginning to wake up to that. OK, people are still seduced into some of the illusion that, that remains on Ukraine, on COVID, and all the, all the other narratives that have been created out of lies. Um, it's not just America that's the empire of lies. I'd say every government is dealing in lies to a greater or lesser extent, and they're all beholden to money power. But my optimism comes from the fact that we've been provided with the means to communicate as people rather than through these corrupt hierarchies where in order to become a president or a prime minister or a, a minister of any sort, you have to lie. Um, whereas, and this all comes from this idea that we trust the medium rather than the people. Whereas if we're dealing interactively with each other, we can decide who we trust and who we don't trust. But at the moment, we're enslaved to a system of lies that we cannot trust. And that is going to change. The age of plunder is coming to an end. That's a good quote to end on. <laughs> As a good friend of mine, the late Bob Crow, a trade union leader of great repute, once said, I don't care what's on my banknotes, the Queen's head or the Queen's backside. I just want more of them for my members, the train workers in Great Britain. Uh, that much I wholeheartedly agree with. I myself don't care what the money is called, uh, but I cannot accept that one country can use its largely self-appointed domination of the world's currency and uh, economic matters in order to subjugate other people. I love America. I'm one of the few people on the left in British politics with American blood in their veins. My great-grandmother emigrated from America to Scotland. She got on the wrong boat, I think. I have nothing against the American people. I just don't want to be an American. And I certainly don't want to be ruled by Joe Biden. Who would? It's been marvellous for me. I hope you enjoyed Kalimahora this week. Until the next time, farewell.